Welcome to Dave's Daily Crypto Take. Today is Tuesday, February 1st, 2022. Let's take a look at today's charts. At number one, we got BTC, $38,322, one cent, up 3.77%. Ethereum at number two, $2,696, 42 cents, up 6%. Tether at number three, $1. At number four, BNB, $377.53, up 2.12%. At number five, USD coin, $1. At number six, Cardano, $1.05, up 2.60%. At number seven, Solana, $102.25, up 12.29%. XRP at number eight, 61 cents, up 4.54%. Terra at number nine, $52.44, up 17.38%. And last but not least, number 10, Polkadot at $19.27, up 8.12%. Let's take a look at the crypto fear and greed index. Extreme fear can be a sign that investors are too worried. That could be a buying opportunity. And when investors are getting too greedy, that means the market is due for correction. And what we got today is fear at 26. Yesterday was extreme fear at 20. Last week was extreme fear at 12. And last month was fear at 29. Let's take a look at our five articles for today. Article number one is... Trezor responds after YouTuber hacks its hardware wallet recovering $2 million in crypto. Article number two, Bitcoin, Ethereum sentiments are in the fear zone, but here's what's really going on. Article number three, Ethereum suffers worst month in nearly two years. Sol falls even harder. Article number four, UNICEF warns against child safety risks associated with crypto transactions. And last but not least, the main topic today is Ali Ray on making millions, sex stigma, and her OnlyFans crypto crossover wet space. All right, before we get into the articles, just want to say thank you so much to all my subscribers and all my supporters. Thank you so much for checking out Dave's Daily Crypto Take on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts. And if you're on the YouTube space, please like, share, and subscribe. It does help me out greatly. All right, so let's get into it. Article number one is Trezor responds after YouTuber hacks its hardware wallet recovering $2 million in crypto. Hardware crypto wallet provider Trezor has responded after a hacker detailed how he managed to recover his digital assets after losing the pin to the storage device. In a detailed YouTube video, Dan Reich, uh, an electrical engineer, explained how he managed to crack a Trezor One hardware wallet containing more than $2 million worth of cryptocurrency. The wallet owner had spent $50,000 worth of Bitcoin on Theta tokens in 2018. The tokens were held on a China-based exchange. The cryptocurrencies were transferred to the hardware wallet following the digital currency crackdown in China. However, he forgot the PIN. The wallet was automatically wiped after 16 incorrect PIN guesses. The need to recover the assets emerged last year after Theta tokens surged to an all-time high value of almost $15 in 2021. The token has since corrected to trade at $2.70 in by press time. Reich managed to hack the wallet alongside Joe Grand, a hacker who detailed how he explored a potential shortcoming in the storage device. So how the hack was achieved? According to Grand, Trezor One wallet temporarily removed the pin and key to the RAM during a firmware update. At this point, they deployed a tactic identified as a fault injection attack to recover the credentials. Grand stated that the wallet moved the necessary information back to flash after the update. The technique changed the voltage directed towards the chip. He explained how they managed to get the phrase code and the pin. Quote, we are basically causing misbehavior on the silicon chip inside the device in order to defeat security. And what ended up happening is that I was sitting where, here watching the computer screen and saw that I was able to defeat the security. The private information, the recovery seed, and the pin that I was going after popped up on the screen, said Grand. He noted that based on the version of firmware running the wallet, the information was not moved but copied to the RAM. Consequently, if the hack failed RAM, could have erased the pin details and the credentials could be stored in a flash. A trick enabled them to surpass the security, but the microcontrollers prevented hackers from reading RAM. The hack was also successful considering previous research and guide on how to successfully unlock a Trezor wallet. They explored a vulnerability that allowed them to put the wallet in firmware update mode, enabling Grant to install unauthorized code on the device. This approach helped him to read the pin and key while in RAM. So Trezor's response. In response, Trezor indicated that the exploit had been fixed. The wallets can no longer copy or move the key and pin into RAM. In a YouTube comments section, Trezor expressed, 
Quote, hi, we just want to add that this is an outdated exploit that is not a concern for current users and that we fixed in 2017 right after a report that we received through our responsible disclosure program. This attack requires full physical access to the device and there is no record of any funds being compromised. So there you guys have it. What do you guys think about this article? Trezor responds after a YouTuber hacks its hardware wallet, recovering $2 million worth in crypto. Comment down below and let me know if you have Trezor or Ledger wallets. Okay, article number two. Bitcoin, Ethereum sentiments are in the fear zone, but here's what's really going on. It wasn't a very happy start of the year for most bulls as the market resembled a slaughterhouse and crash after crash affected investors' spirits. Feelings might not seem important in the crypto sector, but they can often point at changing fortunes. So it's time to take a look at the top two crypto assets. Sigmund Freud analysts this. The crypto analytics platform Sentiment recently noted that despite mild rallies, traders have been opting for caution as fear still hangs heavy in the air. Looking at weighted sentiment for Bitcoin and Ethereum, both were in the fear zone below minus 0.5 at press time. While this might sound gloomy, sentiment reminded watchers that negative sentiments can at times trigger a rise in price. Bitcoin is back above 38K and Ethereum is up to $2,580. There's a long way to go return back to mid-November, all-time high levels, but traders appear to be quite doubtful. This negative sentiment has a high probability of fueling further price increases. According to CoinMarketCap, Bitcoin saw a price increase of 6.07% over the past seven days for Ethereum. This was 4.88%. That being said, more metrics are needed to understand exactly how feelings translate to activity. Looking at velocity is one way to do this. On 29th of January, Bitcoin's velocity was around 0.044, meaning that the activity the asset was seeing was close to levels last seen in November 2021 before the crash. However, levels are still low when compared to the spikes seen in September 2021. As far as Ethereum is concerned, we can see that the velocity on 29th of January was approximately 0.020. This was after a significant spike several days ago. However, what is interesting to note here is that while Ethereum's price rallied, velocity began falling sharply again. This could be a sign that investors are not making hasty moves. The Ethereum in the room. CoinShares Digital Asset Fund Flow's weekly report helps us get a sharper image of BTC and Ether's travels in and out of cryptocurrency exchanges. After five weeks of overall outflows, the week ending 21st of January finally saw slight inflows. However, not all flows are equal. While Bitcoin saw inflows of around $13.8 million, Ethereum saw outflows of $15.6 million. CoinShares reported stated, quote, current seven-week run of outflows now total about 245 million US or 2% of AUM. Highlighting much of the recent bearishness among uh, investors has been focused on Ethereum rather than Bitcoin. What does this mean for investors? Well, while both Bitcoin and Ethereum bulls might be feeling a little weak in the knees right now, it appears that Bitcoin investors are feeling more up for shopping than their Ethereum counterparts. So there you guys have it. What do you think about this article? Bitcoin, Ethereum sentiments are in the fear zone, but here's what's really going on. Comment down below and let me know what you guys think. All right. Article number three. Ethereum suffers worst month in nearly two years. Sol even falls harder. Most major altcoins have sunk more than Bitcoin, with all members of the coin desk 20 digital assets deeply in the red in January. Ether, the native token of the Ethereum blockchain, has suffered its biggest monthly price decline since March of 2020. Tumbling alongside Bitcoin in one of the worst ever starts to a year in cryptocurrency markets, Ether is down 31% in January, while Bitcoin has fallen 22%. The sell-off also claimed most some of the hottest tokens from 2021, in several cases vaporizing half of their market value or more. Terra's Luna has declined 50% in January, while Solana's Sol has dropped 49%, and Avalanche's AVAX has lost 42%. Bitcoin's dominance ratio, a share of the overall crypto market capitalization, is sitting at about 42%, having dipped below 39% mid-January. According to Denis Vinokurov, head of research at Corinthian Digital, this time last year, Bitcoin's dominance was at 62%. The numbers suggest that the past year's rapid run-up in all coin relative valuations has reversed recently amid the broader sell-off in crypto markets. The highest flyers have suffered the biggest come-downs. 
Ethereum also continued to surrender its lead in decentralized finance, where its dominance is at around 59%, according to data from Defilima. The smart contract blockchain's prowess in DeFi slipped earlier this month to an all-time low of 57%. This points to the strong risk appetite as opposed to capital flight away from riskier assets, said Vinokurov. It's become evident that the microeconomic forces that helped to fuel crypto's bull run previously are turning in the opposite direction, creating uncertainty. Those include the Federal Reserve pivot toward hawkish monetary policies with tighter financial conditions designed to attack inflation. From a previously dovish stance of keeping borrowing costs low to stoke growth. This has led to highest uh, correlations between crypto and traditional markets since March 2020, said Lucas Otomuro, head of research at the Into the Block. By accelerating interest rate hikes and likely beginning quantitative tightening, the Federal Reserve is decentivizing investment in order to manage inflation. According to Otomuro, the outlook seems priced in now. Altcoins are unlikely to uh, pick up until the Bitcoin market turns positive, says Leonard Leo, head of research at Stack Funds. Any action would likely begin with BTC or even ETH, he said. Leo doesn't see the current downward action as a long-term issue, but rather says that the markets are still in a phase of sideways trading and price discovery, with the inflation picture uncertain and interest rates set to rise. All members of the CoinDesk 20 digital assets are in red for the month, Filecoin was down 44%, and Polygon's Matic lost 38%. The last time the entirety of the CoinDesk 20 traded in the red over the course of a full calendar month was last June. So there you guys have it. What do you think about this article? Ethereum suffers worst month in nearly two years. Sol falls even harder. Comment down below and let me know what you guys think. All right. Before we head into round two of the articles, just want to say thank you so much to everyone. I've been looking at the analytics and I've seen much more uh, engagement from people in Europe. So thank you so much to all my peeps there. And if you have any friends that want unbiased news about crypto, please let them know about Dave's Daily Crypto Take. All right. Let's get into article number four. UNICEF warns against child safety risks associated with crypto transactions. So the increase in crypto adoption across the globe has irked some organizations. The latest to express its reservations about the industry is the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF. The organization has called for greater regulation of crypto markets that would also incorporate child safety and protection. In its prospects for children in 2022 report, UNICEF highlighted several financial and exploitative threats posed by cryptocurrencies. While examining the impact of global financial trends on the underage population, the organization noted that the heightened adoption of cryptocurrencies is demonstrating both the promise of greater financial inclusion and the need for new child safeguards. So government-backed growth. Adoption of the nascent asset class might accelerate even further going forward, noted UNICEF, adding that 77 countries have already shown significant interest by the end of 2021. This has been further exacerbated by economic hardships posed by the COVID-19 pandemic over the past two years. Moreover, the involvement of various governments in the sector has also painted a bullish outlook, even as many regions are experimenting with their own CBDCs. An alliance could also be formed between governments, large banks, and investment firms against challenger banks and the blockchain-based finance. The report further noted, quote, these developments will eventually require the emergence of national and international legal and regulatory frameworks. As we wait to see what direction these trends take us in, the implications for children hang in the balance. So according to the organization, some of the potential risk factors to the well-being of children include financial stability, well, instability, and a dip in government revenue that private cryptocurrencies could cost. It should be noted that here, governments in several countries with a mature crypto industry, such as the USA and Japan, have already put crypto tax regulations in place. Many others, like India and South Korea, are in the process of doing so. So child exploiters uh, aboard the crypto train? Well, UNICEF argued that the new child safeguarding reforms are a necessary inclusion in crypto regulatory frameworks. Given that unregulated blockchain transactions have allegedly heightened the risk of child trafficking, sexual exploitation, 
the sale and purchase of content depicting child abuse and defrauding and extortion of children, it concluded, quote, now is the time to begin incorporating cryptocurrency and digital currency child safeguards into online child protection initiatives. Many in the past have raised several and similar concerns regarding crypto transactions due to their relative anonymity. In fact, uh, several instances of child exploitation using cryptocurrencies have emerged worldwide. But there is always a flip side. However, a silver lining can be found in the fact that technology, as much as of an opportunity as a challenge, unlike fiat transactions that can be completely trailless, blockchain transactions are publicly recorded and can easily be traced back to the very origin. Recently, the IRS shut down the world's largest child pornography site on the dark web and apprehended its perpetrators by backtracking Bitcoin transactions on the site. This connected them to people all over the world who were uploading and downloading this material, along with finding the location of the site administrator. So there you guys have it. What do you think about this article? The UNICEF warns against child safety risks associated with crypto transactions. Comment down below and let me know what you guys think. All right. Last but not least, let's take a look at our main topic today. It is Ali Ray on Making Millions, Sex Stigma, and Her OnlyFans Cross Crypto Crossover Wet Space. All right. So last year, Ali Ray made national headlines after her OnlyFans was discovered by her peers in the neonatal intensive care nursing unit in a top Massachusetts hospital. Management demanded she take down the page, but she instead quit taking a stand for herself and adult industry workers everywhere. It turned out to be a blessing in disguise, turning Ali Ray into a millionaire in a matter of months. Today, she is using her newfound financial success to continue to take a stand for adult industry workers and pave the way for a better financial future for others through crypto. Ali Ray is not only defined by her adult industry work and is a prime example of what is often hidden behind the stigma. She is a naval vet, wife, mother, former nurse, and now an entrepreneur. She even bought Dogecoin at around a penny per coin. Ali Ray is the CEO of Wetspace, a one-of-a-kind platform that helps content creators and find financial success and engage with audiences unlike ever before. Users of the platform also benefit from greater privacy and deeper interaction with those they follow. For example, content creators can mint NFTs or accept crypto tips via private DM chat. Ali Ray and Wetspace seek to disrupt traditional payment providers and take on big banks to stop them from stifling other financial success stories like Ali Ray's. An interview with Ali Ray, welcome to Wetspace. Bitcoinist had the chance to catch up with Ali Ray and talk about the upcoming launch of Wetspace, currently pegged for early Feb. Here's what she had to say. Ali Ray, not at all. When I first heard about OnlyFans, my Instagram and Chive followers would tell me all the time that I needed to start one. I used to think there's no way is ever going to subscribe to me. I'm a 37-year-old nurse and hockey mom from Boston, Mass. But after that first month, I was literally shocked at how much support I had on the site. And it was even more shocked that at how much I loved doing it. I was like a special place for me to really decompress from working in the ICU and give me the opportunity to express who I was outside of being a typical hockey mom, professional by day. It was so much fun. I love sharing this behind the scenes version of my life. Flash forward one year and now here I am creating my own adult platform and transforming into an advocate for sex workers everywhere. I felt the stigma firsthand after what happened to me at the hospital and I want to be the face of the industry because I'm different. I'm not the average adult creator that people are used to seeing and I'm relatable. I hope that people can resonate with that. So Ali Ray said, my husband and I were married at 18 years old. We had three kids throughout our 20s. And when our 30s hit and the kids were finally self-sufficient, for the most part, I think we just wanted to have some time to ourselves to have fun. Reclaim some of that youth that we missed out on. We spent so many years just building our careers, shuffling kids back and forth to hockey that we never really got to take those breaks and have a little fun as a couple. I started on Instagram posting pictures and videos and doing beer reviews, essentially vlogging our newfound freedoms in our 30s. It's no secret that the mainstream financial system for sex workers is discriminatory and broken, Ali Ray said. We never really felt our age. We've always been young at heart. And so this was something fun, sexy, and a little taboo. And we liked it. 
It was during the COVID lockdowns that we started to hear more and more about OnlyFans from fans in the mainstream media. And so one night, I just created one, posted a few pics and short videos, and before you knew it, I had hundreds of subscribers who couldn't get enough of how real, candid, and just overall unfiltered I was on my page. Ali Ray was, while I was in the Navy for six years, I graduated high school at 16, and then I went into the Navy at 17. So my parents had to sign me up to join. I was actually the youngest sailor in the Navy for my first two years of service. I truly believe that it really set me up for success during Hurricane Katrina. I was stationed in New Orleans, which was a nightmare. We had two toddlers during that time, and I ultimately decided to get out after that in late 2006. We now have three boys ages 18, 17, and 12 who all play hockey. We are a very active household and love to travel. Ali Ray, I can't sit here and pretend that I didn't carry some stigma against this industry before I was part of it. I certainly did. Uh, I had my own perception of porn stars and playboy models back in the day. It's very difficult for people on the outside of things to understand that this line of work, and I get that. There are also many people who have strong religious beliefs that shame this type of content. That's difficult to puncture through and change my mind. So that being said, I don't think it's a goal to change everyone's mind or opinion on the industry. Many people don't believe that pineapple belongs on pizza, but we still accept that it's loved by many. Okay, that's actually a terrible parallel, but what I'm trying to say is that here is just because you personally don't engage or consume the type of content doesn't mean that it should be banned, restricted, discriminated against. Another issue that's often overlooked is that OnlyFans has also provided a safer method of sex work for many creators. And these bans and restrictions brought on by societal stigmas could put many of them back in out in harm's way into a very dangerous situations for them to keep making a living while I personally could always run back to nursing. This is a reality for some creators. So you are correct. I don't fit the typical stereotype of this industry, which is why I believe I am the perfect advocate. Because my story shocks people, it doesn't uh, make people question the norms, it changes the perception and the experience of what they have witnessed or seen in the past. I can lead a very normal life as a mother, nurse, wife, veteran, hold a doctorate degree, and yet still take nude photos and make sex videos with my husband on the side. I'm taxed on my work just like anyone else. It's a form of entertainment alongside the lines as athletes, models, actresses, etc. It's not like I'm doing anything illegal like Al Capone or something. So unfortunately, our work is not looked upon as legitimate work, but I can tell you my bank account and my taxable are certainly legitimate. So wet space intends to destroy the monopolistic predatory adult industry. Let's not forget that it's not just creators who are affected by this. There are many consumers who have been discriminated against for consuming the content and actually had their banks and credit unions call them out for it. Anonymity is important to our fans. Wetspace will not collect your personal information or credit cards as other platforms do. You simply connect your crypto wallet and you're ready to enjoy the content. This is very appealing to many consumers because they don't need to worry about their bank statements exposing their private charges with their partners, CPAs, accountants, or banks. When you think about how often you need to show your bank statements to apply for loans or tax purposes, you can see why many users want anonymity. Well, the real challenge for creators is stability. How can you really continue to build a stable this business creating adult content if you may have been given a 30-day notice at any time that you're being shut down because of new restrictions or that you aren't going to be able to get paid because the platform you provide content on has been suspended or lost the ability to do so. You can't. It's no secret that the mainstream financial system for sex workers is discriminatory and broken. If creators aren't proactive in protecting their interests with a backup plan, they just might not be able to see the business crumble, unfortunately. That's something that scares me. The major financial systems are getting increasingly stricter with the adult entertainment space as the stigma against sex workers continues to linger. And although we aim to bring awareness, they still have the upper hand at this time. So uh, there you guys have it. What do you think about this article? Ali Ray on Making Millions, Sex Stigma, and her OnlyFans crypto crossover wet space. Comment down below and let me know what you guys think. All right, let's take a look at the prices one last time before we head out. At number one, we got BTC $38,317, Ethereum at $2,695, Tether $1, Bitcoin 
BNB $377, USD coin $1, Cardano $1.04, Solana $101, XRP $61, Terra $52, and last but not least, Polkadot at $19. All right, there you guys have it. Thank you so much for making this far into the Crypto Take uh, podcast and YouTube video. Again, you can catch me on Dave's Daily Crypto Take on Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And if you're in the YouTube space, please like, share, and subscribe. Other than that, I hope you guys have a wonderful crypto day, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.